I have never seen anything like this big and this perfectly orchestrated. It is unbelievable. And I'm going to tell you, that's a war zone already. It's dilapidated. The only thing that's missing is maybe some tanks, military tanks running through that, that city. And it's full of like military armed vehicles. And they looked like they were preparing for a war. But this war was going to be waged on America, that it was within our own borders. They're adamantly, we're going to war. That's what they're saying. This is not my words. I'm not coming up with a phrase. They're saying, we are going to war. And I ask them, well, what does that look like? Whatever it takes, man. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly, I'm, I'm speechless. I mean, and I, I, I'm like on the verge of tears, to be honest with you. Like, I can't, I can't believe that this is happening in the United States of, of America right now. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Greetings. In the precious, most beautiful name that I know in both heaven and in earth, it is the exalted name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, Yeshua HaMashiach. And welcome to another End Times for the Believers Bible Prophecy Update. Reading from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We are at the cusp, that place that is referenced here, futuristic, that Daniel gave this prophetic word. Verse 4, the time of the end. Today, for those that are likened unto modern sons of Issachar, we recognize that we are now at the cusp of that time, the crossroads, if you will, of destiny. And the signs at this fork in the road, if you will, are twofold. One, it is Jerusalem, the city of the great king, Matthew 5, verse 35. Israel, Jerusalem, that is the first sign. It's referenced in the Old Testament no less than 800 times. The second sign reads, Babylon, daughter of Babylon, mystery Babylon. In today's Bible prophecy, I'm going to take up the subject of both the subject of the city of God, Jerusalem, and that other prominent subject in the Old Testament, Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, mystery Babylon. It is these two subjects are by far the most prominent that deal with the subject of eschatology. In fact, if we were to look at eschatology as a superstructure, the two pillars upon which that superstructure rests would be Jerusalem and Babylon. But first, would you join for me with me for just a moment to pray? Heavenly Father, it is in the mighty name of your Son that we come before you with open hearts, asking you for anointing, that you would speak a word into our hearts. That word may vary from person to person, but it is a word, Lord, that you recognize we need to hear. A word in season, as it were, a word that strengthens those that are feeling wearied and weakened, a word that encourages the hearts 
of those that are discouraged, a word that just sets on fire that heart that wants to serve you and be a light in the darkness of this world, a word simply that is relevant to our individual needs. So Lord, we're trusting you for that anointing, both upon myself to share it and upon those who are taking their valuable time to listen with hopes that you might enlighten their hearts and speak a wonderful, encouraging word to them. I ask these things with my brothers and sisters in the mighty name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. First, we read there Israel, as Daniel referenced it, at the time of the end. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 2 tells us something about the status or the state of Israel in the time of the end. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem, and a burdensome stone to her adversaries. Verse 3, and in that day, what day? We are talking about the day that Daniel references as the time of the end. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth gather together against it. And then in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the woman ravished. Is this not reminiscent of Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse? And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. These two portions of Scripture, Zechariah chapter 12 and Zechariah chapter 14, are just two of many Old Testament segments that deal with the fact of Jerusalem, of Israel, and the time of the end, or what we might refer to as the day of the Lord. And as we note right here, we see that at the time of the end, Israel, Jerusalem, shall stand alone, shall be in a place of isolation during this period of time. Consider this following video. We begin our report in Europe where three nations have made a gesture to the Palestinians. The leaders of Spain, Ireland, and Norway said they will recognize a Palestinian state, which they had not done before. The Wednesday announcements come seven and a half months after the start of the war in Gaza and despite Israel's repeated objections. They join more than a dozen European nations that have already done so. Many countries, including the United States, advocate for a two-state solution, but the Biden administration argues the move must be negotiated. CBS News foreign correspondent Imtiaz Tayab has more. Imtiaz? Well, this is an extraordinary move by the leaders of these three countries to formally recognize a Palestinian state. Uh, in a statement, they all collectively said that this was a time for peace and made it clear that uh, they believed that peace and safety could only be achieved through the recognition of a Palestinian state and indeed the safety of future generations of Israelis and Palestinians. That is an unlikely source that we would normally use to make reference. But the fact of the matter is that even the liars, the propagandists, cannot deny the reality that Israel and Jerusalem, they are isolated and standing alone. And so we have the first sign, Jerusalem, Israel. And we have the second, which is Babylon, Eschatology foretells future Babylon will be plagued 
with civil war. And there is a growing consensus that soon in our very own cities, if indeed Babylon is representative of USA, a significant component of Babylon anyhow, that in these last days, there is ominous reason to believe that civil war is just before us. What we know for certain is that the ominous omission of our country, the United States of America, speaks volumes through its silence. There is an estimated range between 20 million and 35 million migrants, refugees, illegal refugees, if you will, that are by and large male, fighting male military age individuals. They're coming through the borders without families. And Jeremiah 51 verse 14 says this regarding the future Babylon. The Lord of hosts hath sworn by himself saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. I want to repeat that one more time. A prophetic word to the future Babylon, the modern day Babylon, Jeremiah 51 and verse 14. The Lord of hosts hath sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. Take a look at this. There's 45 million illegal aliens in America right now, 45 million. And a black, I went, I spoke to a, a, a female precinct leader in the GOP. There's only two GOP offices, I think, in all of, all of Illinois. One of them is in Southside. And she tells me, she goes, do you think this is coincidental, JJ? You think this is just happenstance that the black population is decreasing in Chicago? They're about 700,000-ish. Do you think it's, it's, it has no meaning that the mayor Johnson two weeks ago said out loud, we're bringing in 700,000 illegal aliens. It's a one for one. They're replacing us. And I didn't even use the word replacement. They all did. I'm talking from the highest level intellect down to street level knowledge and everyone in between. We are being replaced. We are being replaced. And I'm like, wow, they are absolutely, they're on the front lines. And as these men told me, these gang members told me, if they think they're going to take it from me, they got another thing coming. We're armed to the teeth. We got 100 round drums. We got clips, magazines that have 30 rounds in them. We're not going without a fight. That's petrifying. I don't want that in America. You know, we throw this term war around a lot. And I've thought a lot about this since you and I've been talking over the past few days, this idea, I've thought it was going to be a civil war. We've been thinking of the term civil war in the United States, Americans against Americans right now. But I think it's not. I think what you saw in Chicago, what you're seeing with your documentary treason, what you're uncovering, is it is it is an invasion and it is a, we, it's a repelling of an invasion. That will be the war. Speaking again prophetically about their future Babylon. In Isaiah 47, verses seven through nine, we read the following, verse seven. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst thou remember the latter end of it. Therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, describing that future Babylon, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things, the Lord says, shall come to thee in a moment, in one day. First, the loss of children. Secondly, widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries. That word sorceries also means witchcraft and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. So this here Babylon is described as a, na a nation given to witchcraft. And for those of you that have done 
any research at all, especially if you have gone down that rabbit hole, you will quickly note that those who are pulling the strings are in fact worshipers of Satan. Satanism is the religion of the deep state, the puppet masters, if you will. Once again, in terms of how short shall the judgment come in Revelation 18 and verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. So much is said right there burning with fire. Jeremiah 50 and verse 32 states the following, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, a fire in the cities, and it shall devour all round about him. And again, there is much discussion about the possibilities that at a certain point in time, perhaps at the time of election, or even before, that there is going to be a repeat of the rioting in the cities. But this time, things are going to be significantly different. Jeremiah 51 and verse 58, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. And so we are seeing here that one of the means or instruments of the judgment upon this future Babylon is going to be that the cities are set on fire and that there is going to be a great influx of men, young men, who are going to rise up against that nation. Jeremiah 15 verse 40 states, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell there. And as I did mention, by the way, Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 36 says something about those propagandists, those liars in Babylon. Verse 36, Jeremiah, a sword is upon the liars and they shall dote. A sword is upon her mighty men and they shall be dismayed. So this nation of Babylon is so much given to lying and propaganda that the reference is made specifically that there will be judgment upon the liars. Their day is coming. Their day is coming when they will give their last lie. And so we see here reference to the future Babylon at the time of the end. For many decades now, scholars of biblical prophecy, or should I say eschatology, and students alike have all agreed upon this one fact, that as long as the nation Israel is a nation with its Judeo-Christian principles and God-inspired constitution. For all intentional purposes, the nation must be taken out. It is agreed upon by all. If there is going to be a one world government, there must first be the removal of the one specific obstacle and that is the nation whose principles is that of Judeo-Christian principles. A one world government that will be headed up by that infamous character that we know as the Antichrist among many other names given to him. And rest assured, those prophecies given about that one world government will come to pass at the time of the end. The concept of the United States being represented by Babylon or the daughter of Babylon or mystery Babylon has really been a popular view for many decades. But now, today, it is becoming a most popular view. 
that Babylon is in fact being represented by the United States. Interestingly enough, in terms of the ultimate king or the Antichrist, I'm sure most of you by now have heard that the head of the World Economic Forum, which was started by that person in 1971, has resigned, and that is Klaus Schwab. And another person who is a part of the modern-day Babylon, if you will, Iraq, the president of Iraq, has suffered a fatal accident. And I just don't really, well, I think I know where he is. There are many characteristics by that refer to the modern day Babylon that can only be ascribed to the United States of America. And we don't have time to address all of them. And the parallels continue to grow as things unfold in these last days or in this time. But one of those things, again, that seems to be developing and consistent with the prophecies of Babylon is, again, the immigration of uh, uh, age individuals, military age, that uh, we're, will be participating, sadly, in an internal war in our very own cities. For example, Jeremiah 15, verse 30, Therefore all her young men shall fall in the streets, and her men of war shall be cut off in that day, saith the Lord. Note there, fall in the streets. And again, Jeremiah, Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. And so we see the illegal immigration as becoming a strong potential for that being fulfilled, one of those characteristics of the modern-day Babylon. There are also many other creditable sources who have, in forms of visions and dreams on record, have seen the end of the USA as being a part inflicted by the civil war or internal war. Some of you have read or listened to some of the work by uh, uh, individuals like Demetrius Dudeman or Henry Groover, one that many don't realize had a vision of the United States, an open vision of a great civil war in the last days, was the father of our republic, George Washington. And in his vision, he saw three perils. And the third peril, he said, was by far the most fearful. He saw the nation in mortal civil war. And again, as I said, other individuals have had visions and dreams of this very thing. And when those visions and dreams are consistent with the word of God, I think it behooves us to listen. One of those individuals who I have grown to have much respect with regard to the Lord given dreams is my own daughter, Danielle, who in 2015, God gave her an amazing dream. And I want you to just listen to this for a moment again. 2015. This is now 2024, nine years ago. Take a listen to this. If I go to the next dream, which was actually in September of 2017, this time I was shown an American flag. The first thing I noticed was how massive it was. I I guess I'd compare it to an IMAX theater screen. As I'm watching this massive American flag be elevated up into the sky, below it is a tarmac and it's a massive tarmac and it's full of like military armed vehicles. And they looked like they were preparing for a war but this war was going to be waged on America, that it was within our own borders. As I'm seeing this flag being elevated up, it's almost as if it's signifying the boastfulness of a once most powerful nation. Let me 
me tell you something. The United States of America is the most powerful nation on earth. Period. Period. It's not even close. No nation attacks us directly or our allies because they know that's the path to ruin. No nation attacks us. But once it reached a high point, it quickly divided abruptly into three segments, red, blue, and white. The red shot over to one side and then the blue to another. And as fast as it happened, the white shot up and vanished in the clouds. Isn't that amazing? Whether or not our interpretation or speculation of the United States as being referenced by the mystery Babylon or the daughter of Babylon, it is in fact indeed conjecture or speculation. But the trends, as we've just mentioned here, they are pointing more and more convincingly to that very fact that the USA, if not the Babylon, is a significant component of that Babylon. One thing is certain, and that is this, the omission of the United States of America, the greatest power the world has ever known, it is an ominous omission. And uh, that is something that has to resonate. In fact, there are many, according to many, think tanks, they too are seeing the demise of our country, at least in part, being the result of major internal conflict. And then, apart from the civil war, and I say none of these things with any delight at all, to the contrary, it is so troubling to see we just celebrated Memorial Day and knowing that our soldiers, our sons, our fathers, our treasure have spilt their blood on the battlefield for the freedoms that God has blessed this nation with, the intense suffering that it is very difficult to cope with, to see from whence we have fallen, but we got to face the reality and the Bible, I believe, addresses it for those of us who believe in the, the literal inspirational nature of God's word. There's another parable outside, or peril, should I say, outside of the uh, internal conflict. And it is something that, that I would like to underscore from a snippet of one of several messages that I delivered with regard to the peril that this nation faces. Take a listen to this. This is what the prophets say about the great enemy of Babylon. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate. They come from a far country from the end of heaven, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Remember which country the prophet said was from the north? The same country that Ezekiel said will lead a great alliance of nations to the borders of Israel? If war happens, the United States must be the first target. That is why the prophets foretell that at the start of this war, Russia will unexpectedly use a very special weapon the weapon of indignation against the whole territory of the U.S., a weapon like which the world has never seen. The Holy Book shows how Babylon will feel the fury of this terrible weapon. This weapon will hit our entire country and all our defenses will be in vain. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven and though she should fortify the height of her strength, Yet the spoilers come unto her. This weapon paralyzes our military and leaves it almost defenseless. How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. Their might hath failed. The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken. 
and her high gates shall be burned with fire. She hath given her hand, her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down, because the spoiler is come upon her, even upon Babylon. And her mighty men are taken, every one of their bows is broken. And after the attack, Babylon is left silent and in darkness. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. There is so much poking of the bear today. That powerful nation to the north that is hardly a day goes by when we're not hearing something about Russia, 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 Ukraine, and of course, what's going on in the Middle East. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 15 the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Just today, I saw a little footage of what took place in Israel when they were attacked by Hamas and the, the unspeakable things that were done to children and to women that I'm not even inclined to speak it on this program here today. But again, there the mighty man shall cry bitterly. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 21 puts it in this larger scope. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Again, in that day, it shall be across the entire world, the scope of the judgments of God and upon the high ones the ones that are spiritual in nature, and they will not escape. And we'll be saying a little something about that in a moment here. And then again in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 6, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It is without doubt that this day of coming judgment encompasses the entire world. But what about the nation of the United States of America? Again, what can we learn from Bible prophecy regarding the fate of our homeland where I'm speaking today from? Who can deny the systematic unraveling of the United States of America. Our Constitution is being torn apart piece by piece right before our eyes our, by statutes and statutes, amendments torn by amendments. What are we to make of the undeniable heartbreaking reality of our land, of home of the brave, land of the free, America, America, that land that was crowned by God with goodness and brotherhood from sea to shining sea. What is becoming of this once great nation we have all loved? What does the Bible have to say again of this land of the free about the home of the brave? Nothing. It says nothing. Absolutely nothing. Or it's saying everything. Everything. If we equate Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, to the hammer of the world. And so we know that the sons of Issachar, the sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, who had understanding of the times, and that should be representative of us, and likely is that those of you who are listening are likened unto the sons of Issachar. You have understanding of the times, and that's why you're listening to today's broadcast. You have understanding of the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. To understand the times is critical. 
But equally critical is to know what to do, understanding the time and knowing what to do. And what must we do? In simple terms, we must believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We must do what the scripture tells us to do, cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us, according to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, including all of our fears. Perfect love, John says, 1 John 4 and, 8 and verse 18, there is no fear in love because perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We must believe the gospel, the gospel in the gospel of John chapter 14, where we read that he is coming for us before the wrath. He promised to come. He has prepared a place for us. And he said, once I prepare it, I will come and I will receive you unto myself. And I will call you up to meet me in the clouds in the air. And guess what? Jesus means what he says. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so we must believe the gospel that he is coming for his bride. He is coming soon. And notice how those of you who have been watching as myself, observing how the enemy himself, the devil and his his cronies, if you will, how they are viciously attacking this part of the gospel, the fact that Jesus promised to come to receive us unto himself, to take us home before the wrath. In the following video, which was recorded just a few weeks ago, in Hawaii, at Pastor J.D. Farag's Calvary Chapel, when he was speaking on the pre-tribulation rapture, the very precise time when he mentions the pre-tribulation rapture, something supernatural breaks out. Take a listen to what took place at his fellowship just as he mentions the words pre-tribulation rapture. Look at this need to be at the ready to give to everyone an answer of that blessed hope that we have that Jesus is coming to rapture us before the seven year tribulation which we are on the eve of. And so you wonder, why was it that there was this outbreak? These are very intelligent beings. These are super intelligent. And yet there is this outburst of, of attention drawn to the pre-tribulation rapture and didn't help the cause of the enemy. It certainly underscored the value of, of a true Bible expositor telling God's people about the promise of the Lord preaching the gospel. And so why was it that this took place from a strategic point of view, from the enemy's strategic point of view? Well, one is, I think, that the the enemy knows that if he can prevent us from 
getting saved in response to the fact that we know we're living in the time of the end and we need to make a serious commitment to the Lord. The enemy knows that if he can get us past the point of the rapture, the chances are he's won your soul because the likelihood of getting saved after that is it's not good and it's going to cost you everything. But there's an even more significant reason. I believe as I've pondered and thought about it and, and asked the Lord for, for wisdom, and it's this. It's in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 21, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I said we would get back to it. There we read, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. So what is the pre-tribulation rapture mean? It means that we are at the end and the punishment of the high ones of the enemy is just at the door. You might remember where Jesus stated in a certain portion of scripture that uh, there was uh, a possessed individual and the demon, Jesus said, come out. And the demon said, are you come here to torment us before our time, to punish us, to torment us before our time? Well, now it is their time, and there's going to be no escaping because God is about to punish the high ones that are on high. Incidentally, for those of you that, that follow our ministry, you'll note that the most widely viewed a video that we had was from a message we delivered in Temple Baptist in Florida just a few months ago that to date has obtained more than 620,000 views on just Facebook alone. That doesn't count for the other places where it goes, including on other individuals' sites and so forth. And I say that because it, again, underscores the pre-tribulation rapture. That was the subject. As a matter of fact, we have it here in the description box that the pre-tribulation rapture is a significant part, I believe, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It speaks to us that God has so loved us that we are not going to perish, both in terms of the sufferings in this world that is his wrath, which wrath is extended into hell itself. 620,000 views, which is an amazing thing. And so the sons of Issachar understood the times and they knew what to do. And that is, they knew it was time to believe the gospel, to cast all cares upon the Lord, to draw nigh unto him. Have you ever wondered why it is that the five foolish virgins did not qualify for what I believe to be the symbolism of the rapture? They had no oil. And what does oil symbolize but the Holy Spirit? I see that as being a reference to really not being serious with God, having a knowledge of the Lord, knowing, but not know, knowing in the sense of trusting and walking with and believing. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us what we ought to be doing since we know the signs of the times. And this is what James says, and he talks to two categories of people. First, to the believer, to the Christian, and second, to the non-believer. He says in James 4 verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. This may be a word for some of you. You're crying out and asking God, what must I do? And the Lord is simply saying, draw nigh. Just draw near to me. Everything else will be taken care of. Your place, your privileged place, is simply to draw nigh unto me. And then James goes on to say, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so to the believer, he says, draw near. And to the unbeliever, he says, repent. To the unrepentant, he calls them to repent. There is an acronym, NDE, which stands for Near Death Experience. 40 to 50 years ago, it was looked upon with tremendous skepticism, but today, not so. 
As a matter of fact, there have been numerous studies that have incorporated scientific principles of analysis in terms of studying the near-death experience phenomena. As a matter of fact, I have here in the description box, you'll see it, a couple individuals, authors. One is Dr. Jeffrey Lung, who examined over 5,500 5, experiences that he examined employing scientific principles and came up with a, a verdict that was irrefutable of the life after death experience. And uh, I've included here his website for those of you that want to look at. And I'm referencing this here, and, and you'll see in a moment why. Then there's another doctor, both medical doctors, Dr. Michael Sabong. Born in 1982, or in 1982, he did a book, should I say, Recollections of Death, a medical investigation regarding the near-death experience. And then he also wrote another book in 1998, Light and Death, One Doctor's Fascinating Account of Near-Death Experiences. Both of these individuals, again, we have linked in our description uh, uh, box. But the fact of the matter is near-death experience is a real thing. And there are so many amazing testimonies. My wife and I personally listen to them frequently. And those experiences, and you can pretty much tell who was and is a Christian and who wasn't. But they are so encouraging as they describe, first of all, the bliss of heaven. The senses, the sensationalist, uh, uh, sensationalism of heaven itself, the beautiful, vivid colors they often describe as colors that we don't know in this world and sound so glorious and, and smell and fragrances and everything is living, even the grass, the flowers, and it, they go on and they describe basically what the Bible tells us about the bliss of heaven. But there is also the other side that is experienced by a percentage of those, and that deals with the subject that few people like to talk about. And But we have to talk about it because Jesus talked more about it than he talked about heaven. And that subject is the subject of hell. There is in the world death rates, the numbers, I've just pulled it up, of deaths per day is 166,324 people die each day. The vast majority of them falling into a place where they'll never ever escape. In terms of equivalent of per hour, it's 6,930 deaths per hour or 116 deaths per minute or 1.93 deaths per second. And in addition to the major causes of death, there are 49,171 people die per day for other reasons. The point is this, hell is a very, very real place and it is everlasting. It is not what some, whether meaningful uh, and good intentions or not, a place of annihilation. Because if it is, then Heaven is also not everlasting. The fact of the matter is the Bible tells us it is a place that is so horrific that it cannot be imagined by our natural view of things. Hell is spoken of by the Lord Jesus as a place where there is fear, fire, where there is consciousness, where there is feeling, where there is taste, and where there is loneliness so profound, and there is no escape. It is a place of hopelessness. There is a substantial amount of material available on the internet of those individuals who experienced the very sensations of hell. And some of those experiences are absolutely grotesque. One of the more common or familiar experiences was experienced by a, a brother named Bill Weiss, whose heading on his film is 23 Minutes in Hell. And I have included his link in the description box. And he talks about his experience and gives sub substantial scripture that supports everything that God revealed to him for the benefit of sharing with his people. There are 
Others, as mentioned, that have descended into the very flames of hell, that again have experienced the most grotesque things that I'll not even mention it right now. But the point is this, the Lord talked to us about hell because it is not his will that any perish but that all come to repentance, that God has a purpose for man. And that purpose is that we would experience eternal life with him. There is no escaping hell. There is no hope there. Someone said that at the very gates of hell, literal gates, by the way, it should have a big sign, leave all hope here. There are those right now who wish and have wished for a long time that someone would have told them, given them a a good, solid understanding about the alternative of not putting our love and trust in the Lord. They wish they had an opportunity, one that some of you are going to have right now. There are those who will never escape, but you have an opportunity this day. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you to pray with me and to make things right with God so that you will not experience what so billions are experiencing right now, the very fierce wrath of a thrice holy God, because there is an element, an attribute of God, which we don't oftentimes underscore which we should and that is he is a holy god and the proof of his holiness and the intensity of his holiness is demonstrated there on calvary's hill where our lord himself experienced the very wrath of the fierce wrath of a thrice holy god in order that we would not have to suffer as a result of our sinfulness You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. We would do well to understand what it is that we will not perish from, and that is eternal separation from God, and that is just the beginning. So if you want to make sure that you are not going to be among those individuals, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the numbers are staggering that are passing away almost two individuals per second. And then I'm going to invite you to right now, and I'm going to slow down because this is so important. And I'm going to ask you in the name of Jesus, are you sure? Are you sure that if the silver cord is severed and your spirit flies away, which is your real person, that you are going to go to heaven? Or is it possible that you are going to descend into the very bowels of the earth, into the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone, fire and brimstone? If you're not sure, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me and begin by saying this, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose again from the grave. According to the scriptures, so that I could be forgiven. I believe you shed your blood, your precious blood for the specific purpose of washing away all my sins, past, present, and future. So I open my heart and I invite you this day to come into my life by your Holy Spirit. I confess that I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. And now, Lord, I believe, and because I believe, I shall not perish into everlasting hell, but I shall ascend into your presence on that day, whether it be at the rapture or another event that will end my life in this world. Either way, according to your word, 
I believe I am saved. Amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to congratulate you and welcome you to the family of God. At this point in time, it is my privilege to close our message with a duet which the Lord has impressed upon our hearts to sing that I believe, and we believe, my daughter and I, that the Holy Spirit is going to anoint and minister grace to your heart. Until we meet again, and I think it's going to be sooner than most realize because Jesus is coming soon, very, very soon. Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha! Maranatha.